I hope you all enjoyed uh, our uh, short uh, poster session. Um, and we will continue with the next presentation now, uh, which is Bureau Remote by uh, Anand Ranga Jaran. Um, he's professor at the, the Department of Computer and Information Science and Engineering at the University of Florida. Um, before this, he received his PhD at the University of Southern California and uh, was as, at Yale as a postdoc, associate research uh, scientist and assistant professor. Um, his research interests are image analysis, machine learning and computational uh, mathematics. Um, and yeah, I would hand over to you uh, for your presentation now. Oh, thank you so much. Can you hear me? Yes, that's working. Okay, wonderful. Thanks. Uh, I want to thank the organizers, um, especially Tolga for setting this up. Um, it's an absolute privilege to talk to you about shape analysis and uh, quantum approaches in shape analysis. Um, let me just quickly go over a, um, the roadmap. Uh, one point of departure in this talk relative to uh, the previous talks um, by Michael and Roberto is that this talk's primary focus is on um, quantum approaches in shape analysis and not specifically quantum computing. Though, of course, the hope is that these quantum approaches will, will pay off in the form of, um, let's say, Hamiltonians for annealing or even other uh, uh, tensor decompositions in, in quantum computing. The talk is structured to take you through uh, shape analysis, specifically uh, from distance functions, distance transforms, from unsigned distance transforms, which are a shape represent representation. Um, and specifically what we do is, we'll start with Hamilton-Jacobi theory for distance functions, and then move to the equivalent Schrodinger representation, thereby people can see the, the mapping as you go from a classical approach to a quantum approach. Um, then we will go from unsigned distance functions to signed distance functions, and specifically uh, wave representations of signed distance functions, uh, bringing in the complementarity angle to the shape representation. This will be followed with uh, a full-blown complex wave representation showing off what um, entanglement can do for you. Uh, leading to shape matching, and uh, this will have uh, this will be a nice follow up, I think, in some ways to to what Michael presented. Um, and if there's time, we'll round out with um, uh, representational issues and uh, thoughts for the future. Okay, now I don't think we can expect uh, too much familiarity with with uh, shape analysis. So what I'll do is. I'll begin with distance transforms and set them up in the simplest way possible. And having done that, uh, then walk you through going from a Hamilton-Jacobi representation to a Schrodinger representation. So distance transforms uh, have been around in computer vision for probably 40 years, 40 or 50 years. Um, and if you go back to the, to the early 90s, uh, the set of data structures like uh, level sets and fast marching methods, et cetera, became very standard methods for fast computation of, of distance transforms. Uh, and also further with things like the iconal equation, et cetera, which we'll briefly allude to in this talk. Okay. Now, the interesting thing is that the connection between distance transforms and Hamilton-Jacobi theory, that is classical physics, is well-established. Um, you will see countless numbers of papers in the, in the literature that discuss this connection uh, and then leverage it as well. But you won't find as much that take you from Hamilton-Jacobi theory to the equivalent Schrodinger representation. And that's where we come in to, to fill in the gap. Okay, so let's start. So if you have no background at all in distance functions, uh, and no background in Hamilton-Jacobi theory, uh, don't worry about it. This will be, uh, in a sense, a tutorial for it. So imagine you have a set of points um, in R2, and it's, a, it's just a Euclidean space. What you want to do in an unsigned distance function or an unsigned Euclidean distance transform is for each point on the grid, you want to find the distance to the nearest point of the set of points that you have, which are the set of points yk. So at each point on the grid, you're going to find the distance and you're going to mark it with the distance to the nearest point. 
Now, this goes by many different names. You may have encountered this in 2D and 3D as the Voronoi problem, uh, but we won't go into too many computer science data structures here. We'll just stay with distance transforms and uh, the connection to Hamilton Jacobi. So when you do this, when you set up S of X, where X is the set of points on the grid, you get an unsigned distance function. What I mean by unsigned is that there's no notion of an inside of a shape versus the outside of a shape. What you get is just a geometric object, which is called the distance function. And later on, we will introduce sign distance functions where you will have an inside and an outside, and that will be the, 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 the point of departure from these unsigned distance functions. Okay, so you compute then the distance from yk for every point on the grid and you find the, the, the minimum distance. And what you notice right away is that this distance function has the property that almost everywhere, its gradient magnitude is one. And the reason for this is that you can think of this as a, as a, uh, a problem where you have wave fronts emerging from each of those points and they move until they meet wave fronts coming from other points. And effectively what happens is the distances that are stamped out uh, basically have a gradient magnitude of one and they look like cones, as I'll show you in a minute. The, the fast marching and the fast sweeping methods, they took advantage of this and came up with efficient solutions, which are order n log n or even order n in some um, circumstances. And uh, the important thing here is that analytical solutions, while being unavailable, you have very good data structures that uh, are capable of solving this problem. So the hamilton jacobi equation for this is the magnitude of grad S is equal to one. It's that is Sx squared plus Sy squared, where Sx, Sy are the gradient, equals one almost everywhere. At the points themselves, S takes the value zero, and that's called the zero level set. Uh, which will be important, late, important later on. And basically what happens is that you want to find this function S at every point on a grid. Okay, so this is how you go to the Hamilton-Jacobi theory where you have this, this scalar field S of X that you're trying to compute at every point. Now, this is what the distance transform looks like uh, for a random set of points in R2. It's basically, um, uh, as you can see, a set of cones with values of zero at the points themselves. And then the, the distance increases as you move away from it. Now, what you can do is you can leverage the fact that Hamilton-Jacobi theory and Schrodinger equations are very tightly connected. And what you can actually do is you can try and write down a static Schrodinger equation for this problem. So I want you to not bother about this particular standard Schrodinger equation, but instead focus on the static Schrodinger equation that I've written down here, which will look mysterious at this point in time, but that's okay. We'll set it up and show you the connection between the static Schrodinger equation that I've written down here and the Hamilton-Jacobi problem that we set up for the distance function. So specifically, Consider a static Schrodinger equation, which is minus h cross squared del squared psi plus psi equal to psi naught. And psi naught is a set of initial conditions. You can think of psi naught as an initial wave taking the value something like one at all the points themselves. And you're going to then try to find a solution psi at every other point in space. This also goes by the name, the screen Poisson equation. And for, this, for the purposes of this discussion, Think of h cross now as just a, as a computational free parameter, which can take values very close to zero, okay? So what we've done is we've mysteriously introduced a static Schrodinger equation, and the payoff is gonna be that we will connect this Schrodinger equation back to the Hamilton-Jacobi equation that, that we started things off a couple of slides ago. So what is the relationship? The relationship basically is this, that if you start with, with grad s equals one, and you write down minus h cross squared del squared psi plus psi equal to psi naught, then if you set up psi of x equal to e to the minus s over h cross, where s, I'm deliberately abusing notation and using the same s that I have here as that of the Hamilton-Jacobi equation, 
then basically what happens is that if you write down the actual differential equation by substituting e to the minus s over h cross, instead of psi, you end up getting the magnitude squared of the gradient, gradus squared minus h cross squared del squared s equals one, which tends to gradus equals one as h cross tends to zero. So basically, uh, I want the takeaway from this is that the nonlinear Hamilton Jacobi equation is classical. It's, mag it's basically magnitude of grad S equal to one, except where S goes to, to zero at the, at the level set where the points are. The linear Schrodinger equation, if you make the connection that psi of X equals e to the minus S over H cross, then you end up getting something very similar, which is the magnitude of grad S squared minus H cross squared del squared S equal to one. And for those people in the know, this is called a, a viscosity equation for the Hamilton Jacobi equation but we don't need to worry about that at this point. Another takeaway here is that note that the wave function is real. This will be quite important as we proceed later on because later on what will happen is we will make the wave function complex in order to be able to go from the unsigned distance function to the signed distance function. But for now, all I want you to take away from this is that classical methods solve gradus equals one what we can do, if we so desire, is that we can solve the linear Schrodinger equation. The classical equation does not have a closed form solution for S, but what we can do is we can take minus H cross squared del squared psi plus psi equal to psi naught and attempt to solve it um, in terms of a closed form solution and then find out how long it takes to compute it. Okay, so this, I want to, I want to give a shout out to Jeremy Butterfield uh, a wonderful paper that was written many years ago called on Hamilton Jacobi theory as a classical root of quantum theory, where he basically pointed this out that you can think of quantum theory having a classical root in Hamilton Jacobi theory. And that pretty much then set up everything that we did, which is to go from static Hamilton Jacobi equations to the corresponding static Schrodinger equation. Okay, so we can now try to solve this equation, minus h cross squared del squared psi plus psi equals psi naught. Uh, psi naught will be peaked on the actual shape, which are the shape points as we're call, calling them. It, it will go down to zero elsewhere. And there's an analytical solution in 2D. And the solution you get is that you get psi equals k naught, which I'll tell you what that is in a moment, x minus y k L2 norm over h cross. So basically, uh, you have an analytical solution in 2D for the, for the static Schrodinger equation. And this we're calling the Schrodinger distance transform when you take minus H cross log of it, because then as H cross tends to zero, you can relate this distance transform to the original distance transform, which did not have an H cross in it. So essentially what we have done is that we have taken the Hamilton-Jacobi equation corresponding to uh, the, the um, unsigned distance function. We've gone to the static Schrodinger equation. We've set up the static Schrodinger equation. And for those people in the know, this is essentially a screen Poisson equation with the forcing function. It has an analytic solution. And the analytic solution is basically has these special functions called K naught, which is nothing but a modified vessel function of the second kind. And if you look at it carefully, you'll notice that psi of X is just the sum over K, K naught of X minus Y over H cross. You can actually compute this fairly efficiently because what you can do is you can set up the K naught, which is the Green's function for the problem, put YK as one at all the points where the, where the where actual points are present. And then you can, you can set up this psi of X as a fast convolution using a Fourier transform. So you can set up a, in 2D and in 3D, uh, there's a corresponding analytical solution in 3D as well you can essentially set up a fast convolution-based method to solve this. And that's the quantum analog to solving it using fast marching or fast sweeping as in the static uh, Hamilton-Jacobi equation. Okay, so what does this mean? This means that you can compare these two carefully, right? You have a nonlinear Hamilton-Jacobi equation, a linear Schrodinger equation. The nonlinear Hamilton-Jacobi equation looks like this. The Schrodinger equation is a screen Poisson equation. You have the equivalence between S and Psi. And 
you have no smoothness control because there's no H cross parameter in Hamilton Jacobi. Uh, here, you're going to have an inherent smoothness due to H cross. The wave function is going to be real. It's not going to be complex. And that's going to correspond to the unsigned distance function. And you can compute this efficiently in order n log n, uh, n being the number of grid points using a fast Fourier transform. There are no numerical issues for the nonlinear Hamilton Jacobi equation, but if you were to do this in a classical computer, you're going to have numerical issues uh, due to the negative logarithm, and you may have to go to, to um, multi-precision or, or uh, variable precision uh, numerics in order to be able to carry this out with good precision on a classical computer. Okay, so what we thought was this had good pedagogical value as well, because people can now see the equivalent of a classical method and a quantum method on essentially the same problem. And here, of course, we are thinking of the wave functions as real, and we have the um, H cross as a computational parameter, which can be sent close to zero. Okay, I will skip over this, except to point out that you can start from a variational problem and end up with a Schrodinger variational problem. And go through the entire sequence from the Lagrangian to the Hamiltonian to Hamilton Jacobi to Schrodinger. Okay, so you can also take this further as we did. You can try to approximate the iconal equation where in, instead of gradus equals one, you have gradus equals f of x, which is the iconal problem. You can now set up the corresponding linear Schrodinger equation for this problem as well. And again, use the relationship that so phi of x is real. I'm using phi here instead of psi, but it's essentially the same thing. And you can think of this s as an approximate distance function, except for the iconal equation. And you can discretize and solve a sparse linear system. Uh, the caveat here is that you no longer have a closed form solution for the linear Schrodinger equation, as you did for the distance function, but you can solve it as a sparse linear system, with, of course, the problem being that, that you may have to use uh, variable precision numerics because of the fact that if H cross is very small, the, the linear system is going to be somewhat unstable. Okay, and we carried out some of this for meshes and for um, retinograms and things like that, just as a, as a showcase that you can do this kind of work. Um, and um, we also made a foray into shapes from shading, but I'm not going to get into that at the moment. Okay, so, um, I want to give a shout out right now to, I checked this with Stephen Jordan at, at, who was at NIST and now at Microsoft, who is a quantum computing guru uh, as to the viability of this kind of a theme. And the reason why I'm bringing Stephen Jordan up here is that he had the exact same idea. And except that he was going to set this up with Gaussians rather than with, um, uh, with uh, the, the screen Poisson equation as, as we were doing. And he pointed out to me that to set this up on a quantum computer, the real problem is actually setting up the initial state. Everything else, the fast convolution, the, F, the quantum FFT, all of that is doable, but it, it's actually setting up the initial state that becomes problematic. And um, I leave that up to, to uh, future people to try and crack if they're interested in being able to now take this further to a quantum computer as well. Another shout out to Sibyl Tari, who pointed out that, that all that we had done effectively was go from a nonlinear Hamilton Jacobi equation to a linear differential equation. And that, that, that there was a literature that converted nonlinear Hamilton Jacobi equations to linear differential equations and that she had cataloged almost all of these methods. And therefore the Schrodinger equation being linear fits into one of the class of these kinds of linear differential equations. Okay, so um, let's now move on. Um, Basically, right, what we, what we have done so far is that to, we've kept things very simple. We started with a set of points in 2D. We set up the unsigned distance function problem. And then from the unsigned distance function problem, we go back to Hamilton Jacobi to Schrodinger, but the wave function was real. So now the question is, can we, instead of having the unsigned distance function problem, can we go to the signed distance function where you will have a notion of the inside of a shape versus the outside of a shape? because the sine distance function will be in 2D. Think of a set of closed curves in the plane and imagine that you're going to compute the distance function, which is going to take positive values and negative values, depending on whether you're inside the shape or outside the shape. 
This would mean that we are in the, in the general framework of density estimation, because we're going to basically, our wave function is going to be something like the square root of a density function. It's going to be complex. The magnitude of the wave function will be related to the density function on the shape, while the phase of the wave function will be related to the Hamilton-Jacobi field. Okay, so let's set this up. In density estimation, our Parson windows are the most popular. And in Parson windows, basically what you do is, if you're given a set of points, you put a Gaussian at each point and you sum up all the Gaussians. But we can do better. What we're going to do now is, is instead of the Parson window density estimator, which you're seeing right here, essentially what it does is it takes the set of shape, set of shape points and it puts a Gaussian on each point and there's an unknown parameter sigma, which is then estimated using maximum likelihood cross validation. And this is how you estimate a density function for a shape by putting a kernel function centered at each sample. Why am I mentioning this? The reason for mentioning this is instead of doing a Parson window where you notice that the density function is coming from a real Gaussian being placed on all the shape samples, what we are instead going to do is we're going to take the complex exponential of the distance function. So imagine you have a distance function. Uh, let it be signed or unsigned, it doesn't matter, but signed would be better because then you'd have the notion of the inside and the outside of a shape. And now consider taking the complex exponential of the, of the distance function. Now, for those of you coming from, and by the way, tau, I'm using tau here because tau is gonna be a free parameter, which is gonna be akin to H cross. For those of you coming from a physics background, you are going to expect that if I take the complex exponential of a Hamilton-Jacobi field, e to the i s over tau, the magnitude squared of this distance function, and then also the Fourier transform of this complex exponentiated distance function are going to be related to a density. And so that's what we're going to try and show you. Basically, what we're going to show you is that if you take the complex exponential of the distance function and you hit it with the Fourier transform, e to the minus i nu transpose x. So imagine that f of x is in 2D and nu therefore is a vector of spatial frequencies with a frequency along the x direction and a frequency along the y direction. So it's a 2D Fourier transform. Now imagine that you take the complex exponential, the, um, we're going to start calling this the complex wave representation, and you're going to hit it with a, with a 2D Fourier transform and take the magnitude squared of this, of this wave function hit with, which has had a Fourier transform operated on it. And you'll normalize it using a, a constant C to make it integrate, integrate to one. So this is going to be a density function. Now, what we want to show you is that this does something very interesting, sort of bringing out the complementarity that's inherent in taking the, the complex exponential of a distance function. What is going to happen is that because S of X is a distance transform and you are taking the complex distance trans complex wave representation and hitting it with a Fourier transform, for values of tau that are very, very small, you're going to have high dimensional, you're going to have high fluctuations and most of the fluctuations will cancel out. And in a highly oscillatory integral, what will happen is that only the frequencies at which you get a hit will get picked up. And that's essentially what happens in something called the stationary phase approximation. So what is that? So focus on this integral. You have e to the i s of x over tau. I'm going to now modify the Fourier transform to have s of x minus u transpose x, where u over tau is going to be my frequency. What is going to happen is with tau, when tau goes very close to zero, this is going to fluctuate extremely um, at, at, at with very high oscillations. Most of those oscillations are going to be destructive, but what is going to happen is at the places where the phase is stationary, you end up getting a stationary phase approximation where effectively what happens is the, the um, stationary phase picks out the places where the gradient of this function, the gradient of S hits particular frequencies. So effectively what you get is, the takeaway from this is you get grad S equal to H mu, where basically grad S ends up being picked out at various histogram bins. And you effectively, you end up in the, in the frequency domain. You can think of the frequency bins as histogram bins. And that when you take the magnitude squared, you end up with something like the density function of the distance transform gradient density function. So how does this work? 
you take this to be the actual stationary phase approximation where you're taking the Fourier transform and you're approximating this by expecting tau to be very, very, very small. You get arbitrary phase factors corresponding to the fact that you've not taken the magnitude squared. When you take the magnitude squared and you integrate it, you end up getting that at places where you have spatial frequencies which are picked out by the gradient of the function, you get grad s equals tau nu, and the stationary phase, you get hits at these frequencies. I want to point out that most people coming from a physics background, intuitively, they understand this. They understand that these oscillatory integrals, especially when you hit them with the Fourier transform, that you'll end up getting picking out the gradient of the, um, um, of, of the Hamilton-Jacobi field. But I want to caution you that when you talk to applied math people, they tend to, to look at you as if you are from Mars because they simply don't have this kind of a background, okay? Uh, I also want to caution you that the magnitude squared of the wave function doesn't actually give you the correct density function. You do have to integrate it over a small neighborhood in order to make sure that as tau tends to zero, that you get a, mat you get a matching between the density function that you get by taking the Fourier transform of the complex wave representation and taking its magnitude squared, if you integrate it a little bit in the frequency domain, then you can show that you actually get the density function. And we did this calculation laboriously and, and carried it out analytically and showed this to be valid. Okay, so what does this look like? So essentially, if you look at this distance function of a, of a horse, where we have a, the color coding is the inside versus the outside, where the zoomed portion is actually showing you the gradients, which are all magnitude one, but they're going to have different directions depending on whether they are inside or outside. And effectively what happens is we take the e to the i s of, over tau, and now look what happens when you take the Fourier transform. You'll notice that the Fourier transform because of stationary phase is mostly on a, the, the hits are on a circle. And the reason for that is with the gradient magnitude being one, that shows up in the fact that the Fourier transform of, of psi of x, the hits that you get as you send tau to zero occur only on effectively on a circle in two dimensions and on a sphere in three dimensions. So this is the effect of the stationary phase approximation that we just went through. So um, basically then you can then carry out the actual histogram of the oriented gradients. You notice now that the because the gradients have magnitude one, you don't need to worry about the magnitude of the gradient in terms of its density function. All of its gradients are mostly magnitude one, but the direction is important. So effectively you're doing a density function on the direction of the, the gradient. And that's why the, the Fourier transform um, is only valid at places where you have a, a, a circle, of, circle of frequencies. And if you look at the actual histogram, versus the gradient magnitude squared of the, um, um, I'm sorry, the magnitude squared of the wave function, you'll notice a pretty good correspondence between the histogram of the oriented gradients computed directly from the gradient. Whereas here, the gradient is never computed because of complementarity. You're just taking the complex wave representation, taking its Fourier transform, taking the magnitude squared, normalizing it, and then displaying it. So this is sort of an illustration of the, um, complex wave representation and the complementarity principle uh, in action. Okay, um, so what this means is that you can now start thinking about this complex wave representation as a, as a density function. So you can go from a distance transform now to a density function, which is, which is complex. And you can now think of computing things like averages, which you could not do with distance transforms. Distance transforms are not things that you can add Etc. whereas wave functions being linear, you can add them and you can compute means and things like that. So what we did is we, we took some brain MRI in 3D and did some computations where we computed averages and then went backward and computed the distance transform of the mean and went back and found an average shape, et cetera. So you can sort of walk through this kind of a, of a procedure. Okay, so um, we call this a shape complex atlas and effectively all it is is that that you're, you're coming up with a complex wave representation and then coming up with ways by which you can, you, you can do statistics on it. Okay, so basically so far, what we've done is we've shown you the advantages of the unsigned distance function. 
and that of the sine distance function, where we have taken the complex wave representation by taking its e to the i s over tau. But now the question is, can we do more? And so that we move towards that right now and bring in the concept of entanglement. Okay, so now consider something that is different from what we've seen so far. Imagine that, that in addition to the set of points that you have in, in 2D or in 3D, imagine you also have the orientation. Like imagine that you have the normal to, a, to the point of the curve at a set of finite set of points. Or in 3D, imagine that you have a set of points that form a surface, and in addition to the set of points themselves, you have a, a, a outward pointing normal corresponding to, to, to mu, which is the outward pointing normal at those points. We call this an oriented point set. So in an oriented point set, not only do you have shape locations, but you also have the normals to the shape, and you can think of these normals as either unit vectors or as non-unit vectors, and you can work with both representations. And now consider a wave function, which is directly written, not as a Parson window estimator where you just have a Gaussian, but imagine you've written out a complex representation where you have a Gaussian on the points, but you also have a phase factor corresponding to the, the normal at those points. So what is going to happen is, if you have points that are nearby and their normals are pointing in a very similar direction, and you're taking the sum of these waves, if you take the magnitude squared of this, these waves that are emanating from along the directions that are in the same direction will have constructive interference, whereas the waves that are coming in, coming out of the, uh, uh, the, the shape but pointing in different directions will have destructive interference. So essentially what, what happens is you have a complex wave representation that takes into account the entanglement where nearby points can affect each other, where in, as opposed to thinking of these points as just isolated points, you're now, because of the fact that you have this additional information, namely the, the orientation information, you can think of this as a complex representation with uh, entanglement, where the different waves are entangled with each other. You can of course normalize this wave function so that its norm is one and um, uh, the important thing here to take away is in 2D and in 3D, we are uh, giving you curve and surface information, orientation information in the form of new K is being assumed. Now, the, the setup that we're gonna have, which is slightly different from what I think Michael talked about, uh, is that you can think of this as a template. So you can imagine a situation where you have a template and a template you would have this orientation information, but as you have ta a target in a deformable template situation where the targets would be just points where they wouldn't necessarily have any orientation information. And then the question would be, can you deform this wave function uh, representation onto a target while um, endowing the target with a set of normals so that it too will have sur implicit surfaces corresponding to a set of normals that you're going to induce Onto, onto the target. So, but the bottom line here, right? The important part is let's go back now in, in case you have, I've lost most of you, just notice the important aspect of this, of this wave function. As opposed to the Parson window density estimator, which is the real, we have a complex component and the complex component has just this orientation information. And therefore this wave function will have a phase and you can compute the phase of this wave function, which was missing in the original unsigned distance function computation. So we can show you what the difference is from adding this phase information. So um, the important thing here is, is you get a completion field in the phase. You can now think of assigned distance function level sets corresponding to these phase contours. And you can also compute inner products of this of this wave function and end up with kernels, which are going to be related to things like uh, wave kernel signatures uh, in the literature from uh, Daniel Kremers' group, et cetera. You can get inner products and distances in closed form, but they'll all have this extra information in the form of, of, of this orientation information. You can of course do PCA and, and uh, uh, other types of uh, um, statistics. And in the future, we are actually thinking of you doing P2V mappings. In case you're not familiar with P2V mappings, these are very popular in distance uh, in, in deep learning right now, where you go from a, a point set representation 
to a volumetric representation. And you can imagine that this wave function representation is a very useful volumetric representation because in addition to being the, the real numbers being re related to the density function, the complex numbers are going to be related to the phase which will carry level set information. So let's show you what this means. So take a look at the unsigned distance function and I'm going to show you the level sets of the unsigned distance function. Take a look at this red line and you'll notice that as you follow the red line, you'll notice that there's no notion of interior and exterior. There's no sense of inside and outside. The, if, if there is a shape boundary here, it's missing because there's no notion of inside and outside. In contrast, take a look at the sine distance function coming from the phase. I'm plotting the phase of the wave function, the level sets of the phase. Notice that the zero level sets of the phase carry the shape information in the form of, of these level sets. And there can be a notion of an inside and an outside, okay? In addition to this, these, the, the magnitude of the wave function, you can expect it to be highly peaked at, at these boundaries. So effectively you end up getting a complex field where the magnitude is magnitude squared is related to the density function and the phase of the wave function is related to the sine distance function. So you're essentially integrating a sine distance function and a parson window type density estimation into one representation, which is complex, which has um, a very close resonance to, to what we saw in uh, Roberto's talk, where he went from um, uh, real representations to complex representations. So um, basically, this is a good takeaway that, that this is the extra information that, that you have in the uh, sign distance function. Okay, so take a look at some examples of, of the, I'm, I'm now just plotting the phase of the wave function where what we have done is we've taken these shapes that were given to us by, by a colleague and use the normals. So the only additional information to the shape points are these normal information. And what you're seeing is I'm plotting the, the zero level sets of the, of, the, of the phase. And don't worry about the fact that the phase of the wave function are going to be uh, wrapped. The wrapping has no uh, 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 impact here because wrapped or not wrapped, we can still uh, plot the zero level sets. So this is what it looks like. And in addition to this, you have the magnitude information that is given to you by the magnitude squared, which is the density function of, of the shape. Okay, so what you can now do with this is that you can minimize a closed form distance between these implicit curves and surfaces. So this is what we did. We, we set up a regularized distance between um, uh, wave functions in 2D and in 3D. So we went from an oriented point set template, which you see on the left here, to a target, which is just unorganized. And what this allows us to do is, it allows us to endow the target with, a, with normals, and also endows us to, to take this particular template and take the wave function distance and have it map onto the target. So the, the math is very straightforward. All it is is you compute the uh, L2 uh, norm squared of the source and the modified target wave functions. Uh, phi uh, composed with T is just the, the mapping that we have on the, on the target. And um, I think that what would be very interesting would be to take these kinds of uh, L2 distances that we get and try to rewrite them in the form of Hamiltonians. Because then what this would mean is you might be able to, and of course, this is a long shot, you might be able to take this and eventually map it onto a quantum computer. But that's something that we can, we can leave for the future. <clears throat> um, and obviously the, the work that Michael alluded to toward um, deformable matching uh, with shapes, right? Is, is, is gives us tremendous room for encouragement that you could imagine this kind of computation being carried out in a, in a quantum computer where please note that the wave function would be implicit. We have no access to the wave function. Instead, you may end up with some kind of tensor representation for the underlying shapes where the wave function would be implicit. Of course, here the, there is a regularization of the, of the mapping, which is important, and the regularization is just a spline that's being regularized in this manner. Okay, so um, uh, I am not going to spend too much time on this. This is, uh, you can see the, 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 it's a bit of a con 
uh, in a multiple curves data set, we were able to show that we get pretty good results. But of course, the reason is that we have this extra information in the form of, of uh, uh, surface normals, which you don't have in the case of um, uh, point cloud matching. Uh, however, it would be very interesting to conduct a careful study where you have a Parson window density estimator, where you have points and normals versus a wave function estimator where you have an implicit representation with points and normals in the way we have set it up and compare them to apples to apples would be very interesting. Okay, um, I think that I'm running out of time. Uh, so in the interests of, of time, what I will do is um, just skip over this. Uh, basically, we took this further to Mumford Shah and we were able to show that, um, that a, um, a Mumford Shah regularization simplified tremendously when we introduced a complex wave representation. And um, unfortunately, when we explained this with a lot of interest to computer vision researchers, uh, we got absolutely no feedback from anyone at all, with uh, perhaps the exception of Daniel Kremers. So this is something that could be interesting for the future. I'm going to skip that. Uh, I'm just, to, just going to do a quick shout out to this kind of work, which is uh, where uh, instead of a density function, you represent uh, you can represent numbers as tensors and then start even going from a humble histogram to a, a density matrix representation. And for more of the, for more on, along this line where instead of representing a single random variable, you have a set of random variables in the form of tensor representation and a density function would become a density matrix representation. Take a look at Tide and A. Bradley's thesis, which is I think uh, uh, fantastic in this, uh, in this space. Okay, um, so to conclude, uh, I think we have shown that uh, QM approaches are clearly viable, both from what Michael told you earlier and in this talk, and there's clearly a very close link between sine distance functions, uh, hamilton jacobi theory, and um, wave function uh, representations. Uh, it remains to be seen, of course, whether these wave function representations can be taken further into a quantum computing world where the wave function would be implicit. Um, uh, clearly, we, can, we have thoughts for the future based on our own experiences in doing this kind of work. Uh, so I'll just leave you with some thoughts, uh, which I think had not been talked about earlier. Um, and essentially, uh, the one point that I think uh, has not come up, which is that, that and Tolga alluded to this in the beginning. If you can think of this as sort of like a, we are bootstrapping a new world into being at this point in time, given the fact that, that quantum computing has arrived, there's certainly something that I think has been missed, which is the whole notion of interactive computer vision, which was very popular in the early 90s. So imagine in a distant future, you, you have you know, tensor representations up the wazoo with subsystems. You can imagine that a world of annotation inside a quantum computer where you would have implicit wave function representations interacting with human annotators inside a QC. I don't think this is, would be too far off 40 years from now. Um, and obviously you would have a fight between collapse and non-collapse models of wave functions because the, uh, the role of the annotators in the system would be very interesting. So I leave that as, a, as something that I think uh, Roberto, I think came close to this with his talk about Bayesian, um, um, a, 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 a Bayesian way of looking at, at, at QC, but I want to take that further into positing that interactive computer vision could be a very useful place for QC to set ourselves apart from the classical world. Um, that's it, thank you so much. Right. Thank you very much for this exciting talk. We have time for a few questions. Please, I think we have one question over here. Yes, please. Michael Felsberg from Linköping, Sweden. Uh, thank you very much for an interesting presentation. I would have a question about the FFT-based solutions. Uh, <clears throat> They imply a periodic boundary condition, and I wonder to which extent this leads to artifacts in your distance functions. 
Uh, that, so that's an excellent question. Um, uh, just keep in mind that the distance functions only make sense when you compute them on a bounded domain. So what you can do is you can set up the, the periodic boundary conditions on that bounded domain at the end of the bounded domain. And so then it just repeats beyond that. So that, that, that becomes a non-issue. But that's not really the problem. The, 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 that, it's a very astute question, but the real problem is not in the... There are two problems, right? The first problem is setting up the initial state itself. That's what Stephen Jordan pointed out. But the second problem, at least from a computing perspective, is the negative logarithm. So in fact, it may turn out that we may be better off working with exponentiated distance transforms, where the taking of the logarithm and going to a distance function itself might be somewhat artificial. Why would you want to work with a distance function? You may, because it's, it's a logarithm of a wave function. Instead, if you work with the wave function itself, you might be able to set that up in a, in a Hamiltonian and then do more work implicitly. So that's sort of what I would, I would urge. The focus on the setting up problem, as Stephen Jordan pointed to, and then also the, the, the move away from the logarithm uh, and instead have it in as an implicit wave function with a Hamiltonian uh, in in a uh, implicit setup. So is my understanding correct that you move the problem, so to say, to the inside of the domain so that the boundary is as far away from the domain of interest? The, the, oh, sorry, yeah, going back to the original question, the, 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 in a distance function computation is always on a bounded domain. So if the, if the, if the Fourier domain coincides with the bounded domain, there's no problem. The repetition is only beyond that. The, the, the boundary conditions are on that domain itself. So unless if you move the, the bounded domain to inside the domain for the Fourier, then you'll have a problem. Okay, thank you. All right, unless there are no other small questions, let's thank Anand once again. Thank, Thank you. you very much. And we're moving to our next speaker. Yes, so our next speaker will be uh, Tatsu Jin. Um, he is a professional <coughs> chair of uh, Central Satellites at the University of Adelaide. Uh, he holds a PhD in computer systems engineering from Monash University, uh, which was partly supported by the Endeavour Australia Asia Award. Uh, his research interest lies in the optimization in optimization for computer vision and machine learning um, and its applications to intelligent satellites and space robotics. He has published more than 100 research articles on that subject uh, and he's won several awards for it, including a CVPR award from 2015. Tajun is also the director of machine learning for space at the Australia Institute for Machine Learning. learning, 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 learning. And we will give the speaker a few more minutes to set up the system. Without so the speaker should be the, the external. A speaker should be, a, and that should be the microphone jack. A, no, the microphone should be. A, no, 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 microphone, a headphone. Uh, headphones, yeah, that's okay. And uh, that's correctly set up. Yeah, yeah, so then I got this one. Uh, it's I yours. That that's because this one is, this one is on. Okay, Tolga, can you hear us? Yes, yes, I can. Thank you, Tolga and team for uh, organizing this wonderful workshop and thanks for inviting me to speak as well. This feels like the second half of my quantum computing course currently. Everyone call me TJ, please do that. Uh, that's my initial. And, um, uh, you know, second half of the semester in a quantum computing course, I'll try to make things interesting, okay? So this is the outline. 
And uh, acknowledgements go to my wonderful team who made, made this presentation possible. I forgot Shin Fang's name down there, sorry. Okay, um, let's go from go to the beginning. Which one is the Earth? Do we need to take a poll here in this audience? All right, which one? Literally, I'm asking here. Number one, number two, number three, or number four? Two, three. Is there a four at the back there? Anyway, uh, no one knows the answer to this question in the mid 18th century. So we had to find out, right? But how would you find out? Well, if you think of Polaris as a point source that's infinitely far away, then you could try measure your, your angular distance from the horizon, wherever you are, to Polaris, right? You can, you can look at the sky, oh, there's Polaris. I'm 45, it's 45 degrees from the horizon, all right? Now, if the Earth were perfectly spherical or a perfect spheroid, then the angle that you measure Polaris would be, would be exactly the angle of your latitude. All right. If it's a if it's an oblate steroid, then the situation is different. You can measure Polaris at 45, but your your latitude, uh, it, it, well, this angle subtended by this red line and 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 equator here would be less than 45. All right. So that provides a clue to find out. Okay. So mathematically, it looks like this. If you can obtain measurements of the arc length at several locations, arc length for one degree of uh, polar. Uh, 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 one degree of difference in, in, in Polaris uh, going up or going down. Uh, and, then, and then you check where your, where your latitude is and you can plot this curve, right? If, it, if the earth was a, uh, an oblate spheroid, you would see this curve, right? Between the latitude and the arc length. If it were prolate, then it would look like that. Okay, if it's, if it's a perfect spheroid, what, what would the curve look like? A, a horizontal line, straight line, right? So that's one way to find out. So someone was trying to find out in 1755. His name is Roger Boscovich. He comes from present day Croatia. So Boscovich's data looks like that. This is at 1755, reprinted uh, uh, in, in, a, in a, a subsequent uh, journal article. So he got, we got five measurements from five different locations, at different latitudes and different arc lengths. The twas up there is an old measurement of distance. And I've converted that to uh, 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 this data here, okay? And I've also did the sine square instead of sine. So we have straight lines instead of sinusoid, okay? So he has these five measurements and now he tries to find whether it's an oblate or prolate uh, spheroid. So if it's oblate, then you would see an increasing linear curve like that. If it's prolate, the curve would be sloping the other way, okay? The problem that Boscovich faced was, this was 50 years before least squares. He had more measurements than he had variables, okay? There are only two variables, right, to define that line, but he has five measurements. He didn't know what to do, all right? This is 50 years before least squares. Uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, Jean-Marie Lejean published least squares in 1805. Uh, legend has it that Gauss invented least squares in 1795. He didn't publish it yet. Probably couldn't get past the reviewers. Didn't beat Sota. Uh, uh, trying to make you all laugh here, right? Boscovich can already solve this by checking every pair. Why, why do we need least squares? But, you know, uh, uh, in hindsight, everyone credited, credited Gauss with the invention of least squares because he communicated to his friends about his results first. So moral of the story, always push your work on archive. Okay, so Boscovich didn't know least squares. What do you think he did? He knew given every two points, he knew how to estimate the line. Guess what he did? Guess what he did? He checked every pair, okay? There's only five points, he checked every pair of them. These are all five choose two pairs of line estimates. He said, hmm, these two estimates that go through Cape of Good Hope looks weird. Let's throw it away. These two ones that also pass through Cape of Good Hope, let's throw it away. 
in modern times, what do we call that data point, Cape of Good Hope? An outlier, okay? That's what Boscovich did. And then he averaged the resulting lines. So this is the modern estimate, uh, actually quite far away from the modern estimate, but you know, good enough to establish that the Earth's shape is uh, oblate. You've seen this algorithm before. It's called RENSEC. Boscovich checked every single pair, Fischler and Bowles used a computer to go through the pair sequentially, you know, using a classical computer. Can we check every pair in one go? Is the starting point of this discussion. Okay. So I don't need to motivate these slides to you. Uh, these are very, very influential uh, computer vision problems. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll slide this one in because, you know, that's where the funding comes from. Uh, you can do this in space as well on satellites and, um, and uh, the name, and then you can do post estimation, for example, by solving the PNP problem. So I think one of the things I learned from this workshop is to motivate quantum computing well in the computer vision community, we need to use the computer vision language. Michael has his uh, Smeagol. The name of this satellite is Tango. All right, so we need to use things like this to bring the community along. Anyway, enough about bringing community along. So in, in computer vision, we solve uh, the problem of maximum consensus or consensus maximization, all right? You would find the, find the model that gives you the most number of inliers possible. Model being par parameterized by vector X, you check all points, you find if all the points can fit inside a line with error epsilon. The downside of giving you my phone is that I can't keep track of time. Thanks. Okay, so uh, epsilon here is vital to, to mention that uh, it's an inlier threshold that's constant that's given by the user. Right, well, know what this problem is. So, but to hammer it in, this is a 1D subspace example. It is kind of a running example. So, I'll, pay to, I'll, I'll spend time to talk about this. You need to fit, you want to fit this line that goes through the, the origin. That's why it's called a 1D subspace instead of a line. And uh, this particular candidate, for example, has a low consensus because the number of inliers in that epsilon band is small. This one has a high consensus because the number of inliers are big. Okay, so we want to find the highest possible consensus line. Okay, so that's the setup. What are the fundamental limitations? Every time I present this, someone says, RENSEC already works. I agree, RENSEC already works. Uh, but then every problem that we've discussed in this meeting so far, maybe with the exception of Anand's, everything, there's already things that work. So no apology on that. So, um, so in RENSEC theory, you, if you can check, or, or there is a technique to verify, actually you don't even generate all the, the, these uh, minimal subsets. Uh, if you know what your inlier rate is, if you know the dimensionality of your problem, you can probabilistically uh, sample T, T samples, and with, with some, with, you can sample T samples given by this equation here with some probability of gamma that you can determine the, the key point here is that you can find at least one minimal subset that contains only inliers. So here's an adversarial case that shows that that doesn't work all the time. You have the data points here in blue and the line that maximizes uh, the consensus is actually this line here. And as you can see, it doesn't pass through any of the data points. You can check through all your minimal subsets. In this case, the minimal subset is size one because this is a 1D subspace. None of them will give you the maximum consensus set. And secondly, not all inlier subsets give you a good fit anyway. Uh, so the RENSEC premise is actually wrong. Uh, this is a, now a line fitting problem where, where your line is allowed to go out of the origin. And these two points are inliers and you fit your minimal subset, it gives you a bad estimate. So in practice, RENSEC usually works, but when it doesn't work, you don't know why. You don't know it's because there are no good models to be found or because you were unlucky. So you have to run it again. Okay, more theoretically, uh, we've established results uh, uh, surprisingly for the first time in computer vision that you know, this problem is NP hard. It's W1 hard in the dimension, uh, which implies that doesn't matter what you do, any algorithm that you come up with to solve this exactly will have D in the exponent of N. Uh, so it's always exponential. 
And it's also APX hard, that's even more pessimistic. There are no polynomial time approximation algorithms. RANSAC is not an approximation algorithm by definition because it doesn't tell you how far you're away. There are no error bounds. Slightly positive result, you can show that it's a, a fixed parameter tractable in a number of outliers and dimension, which we presented at CVPR 15. Uh, but uh, 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 so you only scale exponentially with the number of outliers, but the number of outliers can be big in practice. So this is still not the solution. So here's sketching out the landscape. On the left-hand side, you have heuristic or randomized algorithms such as RANSAC and, and variance. On the right-hand side, you have exact algorithms where from the theory, you know there can be no hope of any efficient algorithms. Uh, on the left, the algorithms are very fast usually, but there are no guarantees. And the theory says you can never have any guarantees because it's APX hard. If you want to be fast, it will have to be you know, no guarantees. Uh, for RANSAC type variance, there's also randomized behavior. On the right-hand side, you are, you are condemned to be slow because they, that's classical computers cannot stop that, but you know, you get optimality and you get deterministic behavior. What is in the middle here? It seems that we're only stuck with these two extremes. And more importantly, uh, is there a role for quantum computing in this landscape? So that's sort of our second uh, uh, starting point, uh, second you know, motivation as well. Uh, I slid this slide in to, to uh, uh, very, very superficially show you the different types of quantum computing technology. You've heard uh, presentations on uh, quantum annealing earlier. That's on the left-hand side. In the middle one is an analog quantum. I don't even know what that is. On the right-hand side, there's a universal quantum gate quantum computer. Um, and uh, this, this slide was put up by IBM, okay? So I'm not, not claiming any... any um, uh, credit, certainly not claiming any veracity in these uh, comments as well. They're probably right, but you know, they're not my, my, this is not my slide. All I want to say is that the method presented in this talk is on the one on the right. So not quantum annealing, but uh, quantum uh, gate computing. So down here on generality, you can see that it says it's complete and known speed up. What I understand by complete is that a gate quantum computer, you can look at the theory any problem that you can solve efficiently, i.e. in polynomial time in a classical computer will have a, uh, uh, a polynomial runtime on a quantum computer as well, okay? Uh, uh, that's just a, a really superficial comment I make, but it will come back later during the results. Okay, so uh, now the mathematical derivations before we get to the, uh, the quantum computing bit. I'll try to make this as quick and as painless as possible. I will only summarize the main points that you really, you really need to know. Okay, so we have to restrict somehow the set of problems that we, we look at, okay? And the restriction comes in the form of the type of residual function, the error function we use to you know, decide inlier or outlier in our problem. Specifically, we look at error functions or residual functions that are quasi-convex. Uh, these are functions that are almost convex, but not actually convex, right? So how you define a quasi-convex function is that every alpha sub-level set of that function is a convex set. Okay, so on the left-hand side here, you have a quasi-convex function. It doesn't matter where you put this alpha, the part of the curve or the domain under the uh, curve below alpha, this red line here is always connected. It's always a, a convex set in a higher dimension. This is not a quasi-convex function because here's an alpha where the domain is not connected, therefore not convex in higher dimension. The, the reason for imposing this, I will again remind you later when we get to that point. So here are examples of residuals that are quasi-convex. They happen a lot, not a lot. They happen in a few important problems in computer vision, such as multi-view triangulation or homography fitting. Um, so no need to spend too much time on that. Just rest assured that there are problems in computer vision that satisfy these restrictions. Now, now that we are restricting the quasi-convex residuals, Define the minimax problem. Minimax because you have a min and a max of a set of these quasi-convex residuals given a model X, okay? You wanna find uh, uh, the X such that the maximum error 
is as small as possible. So for example, the blue curves here are a set of quasi-convex function. The max over this function, these functions will be that red line here. And what you can show that uh, it doesn't matter where you put the alpha, the maximum of the quasi-convex functions are still quasi-convex because that red line here is always contiguous in the 1D case or convex in the higher dimensional case. The crux of this is if your residuals are quasi-convex, then you can solve this minimax problem in polynomial time, all right? You, you guarantee that you can solve this in polynomial time. It's efficient, uh, therefore, you know, in theoretical speak, and that will have implications later when we move to the quantum. Here are sample problems that you can solve, uh, uh, sample algorithms that you can solve this. So, uh, you know, give you more intuition, maybe forget about the circle one, because we started with line fitting, look at these bunch of points on the line with some outliers. The minimax problem is to find the band that is as tight as possible that covers all the points, okay? So given a bunch of points, push the boundary lines top and bottom, make them as tight as possible so that you cover all the points. When I say minimax problem next, or when I say function G next, that's the picture that you should have in your mind. So if it's quasi-convex, then if, if residuals are quasi-convex, then the minimax problem G is also monotonic, meaning that if you have data sets, data, data points that are subsets of each other, uh, G of B uh, is always smaller than G of, is never bigger than G of C because B is a subset of C, okay? So again, to motivate that, if I throw more points into the set of blue points here, the minimum width cannot, minimum width band cannot, cannot reduce. It can only stay the same or grow bigger, okay? So that's what monotonicity mean. So coming back to our target problem, which is to find the band of size epsilon that has most of the points possible. That's our target problem, right? If someone gives you a point, gives you a bunch of points and say, that's the solution to your maximum consensus problem, how do you check? You check by solving the minimax problem on that bunch of points, push down as much as possible until you can't push down anymore and check if the width of that resulting line or resulting band is less than or, or greater than epsilon, less than or equal to epsilon. If it's less than and equal to epsilon, then the subset that you solve the minimax problem on is a consensus set. Not necessarily the maximum one yet, we'll get there. Um, okay, so then this allows us to reformulate our target problem as this. Uh, if you have uh, I being the set of all subsets of your data, you can re-express the consensus maximization problem as find a subset that has the most number of inliers. You all know this already, all right? This is just using uh, uh, the minimax language to express it. Monotone Boolean functions and influence. Um, so another reformulation, please bear with me because this is needed to squeeze this into the form that we run on the quantum computer. Uh, if, you have, if you have n data points, we define a vector z that contains nothing but binary binary elements, binary numbers, and these uh, binary numbers basically select the subset of points of your of your data. Okay, so define a set C uh, z z as just the index index of the z's that are one. Okay, that's it. And then we define a feasibility test f over this binary vector z. The, the, the feasibility test returns two numbers, zero or one only. It returns zero if vector Z includes a set of points that are feasible, that are that is a consensus set. If it's not a consensus set, if Z doesn't repand, represent a consensus set, then the feasible value is one. So we can say that the function f is monotonic or monotone because if I give you a z and then I or that z with another z, the feasibility of z uh, uh, cannot, cannot improve. It can only become infeasible. It cannot become feasible by adding points. 
All right. The, the, when you make it as tight as possible and then you throw more points, you can, you can never make it tighter. You can only stay the same or grow bigger. That's what this is saying. Okay. So F is a function that's uh, uh, monotonic. It's a binary function that's uh, monotonic. This is the key feature that we use in our work, given that setup. Let EI be just a vector of all zeros, except one at the ith position. The influence point P, alpha I, is the probability of, if you pick any Z, sorry, the influence of a point PI, the ith point PI, alpha I, that's the influence, is the probability of given any random Z, if you take the point, the ith point in or out of that uh, Z, so in the case where Z originally contains the ith point, take it out. That's what the XOR does. If the point uh, uh, doesn't contain uh, I, add it in. That's what the XOR does as well. And then you check before and after adding or deleting EI, does the feasibility of Z changes? That's what this is saying. And then you ask, what is the probability of this changing, of the feasibility of F changing? What, what is the probability of, of F changing value given you add or delete the i point? In other words, how much influence, uh, how much weight the i point has on this feasibility question, okay? So uh, analytically, to evaluate this probability, that's, that's what you do, right? You, you loop over all possible two to the n values of z. It's a binary vector of with n, n binary variables, all right? So the number of combination is two to the n. You loop over all of them and you count the number of them that causes this flip in the feasibility. This is what it looks like. This is a bunch of points that I generated synthetically. Well, the student Xin Fang generated synthetically. Uh, uh, therefore, she knows that the red are the outliers, the blue are the inliers. Let's compute the influence of every point exactly following this equation here. And this is what we get, right? We, we compute the influence. We sort the influence value. We, we normalize the influence first. We sort from, from large to small and you see a distinct gap between the outliers and inliers. Will this work on computer vision data? Even better, it works in computer vision data. So this is a triangulation problem. Uh, remember I said that triangulation has a pseudo convex residual, therefore the F function needs you to solve the G function, the minimax, the minimax is always polynomial time solvable because uh, the residual is, uh, is quasi convex. So you can also see this distinct gap between inliers and outliers. So the outliers here are wrong, uh, 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 wrongly localized feature locations. The color, color coded here on the left-hand side because it's manually labeled. And you can see a distinct gap between inliers and outliers. And for, for uh, uh, correspondence problems across two views as well, I think we're estimating homographies. Again, you see that the gap is even bigger. Okay. So this tells you that, hey, this is actually a good measure of outlyingness. The trick is how do you compute it? The strict definition of it says you have to check all two to the n possible values of z. How do you use your computer to do it? Any ideas? That's what we did, brute force. With uh, 20 points, you can, eight dimensions, you can brute force, no problems. If you have more points, what do you do? You go back to Mr. Fischler and Bowles' algorithm again. You do random sampling. Okay, so the classical algorithm literally is uh, selecting subsets, and then you collect statistics over that subset, and you now have an approximate value alpha hat, over the true influence, which you have no hope of computing because you know it's exponential. Small problems you can, uh, big problems you cannot. 
and then you collect that statistics over a subset Z instead of uh, you know the the proper sub the proper set Z over with two to the n uh, possibilities, and that's literally the classical algorithm. Uh, and then you know uh, you, you average the results over m of these trials every time you you pick a k tuple from from the data set is exactly like Rensac. Uh, you you check um, uh, and then go for every every model that you you for every z you return so every subset that you sample you you go through every point add that point in or remove that point for z see if that changes the f you collect that statistics and then you average that over over um, uh, you know, over the number of samples or tuples that you've chosen, all right? The total number of F evaluations is N times N. M samples, M sampling of K tuples, and N data points. You can speed it up somehow. You can speed this out by recognizing that for quasi-convex residuals, you don't actually have to fit, uh, you know, K tuples of, of, of any size, you just need to fit the combinatorial dimension of the problem, which is uh, D plus one. So three points in the case of line feeding are sufficient. So one innovation that you can do is to sample only three points. So that's a detail that we don't have to go through today. Now, what's nice about this realization is also uh, now remember this, um, spectrum here. Um, on the left, uh, heuristic algorithms. On the right are exact algorithms. We're trying to write, find a role for quantum computing. What we've discovered in the process is, actually there's another class of algorithms we haven't considered, algorithms with probabilistic guarantees. The APX hardness says you can't have hard bounds on the result, but it doesn't preclude probabilistic guarantees. And by using this uh, influence way of looking at things, you can prove a probabilistic bound on your solution. You know that uh, with some probability delta, which you can control, you just need to control how, how, uh, uh, how many times you sample, uh, your value of the true influence and your estimated influence is probabilistically bounded by that value there. And uh, we, we didn't believe it at first, but we tried it out experimentally and hey, it actually does work, you know, and you don't need to try a lot of iterations for this small number of lines here, uh, with just a few hundred iterations, you can already uh, have very good probabilistic bounds. And the more you sample, of course, you know, the tighter that probabilistic bound becomes. And it, it works on the real data as well, so I won't, I won't go through this. All right, finally, the quantum algorithm. I have at least 10 minutes, I think. Um, we started off with the premise, can we check all the subsets simultaneously in one go? And then I told you that's actually a bad thing to do because none of the subsets will give you the right results. None of the subsets will give you, there are adversarial cases where none of the subsets will give you the result you're looking for. And then we switch to using uh, influence instead, computing the influence of in every single point instead of uh, uh, estimating the model. So the circuit we ended up using is uh, called the bernstein vasinary circuit or BV circuit. It looks like that. It's a very, very standard quantum circuit in any quantum textbook. So we did not invent this at all. The key thing is that the function, Boolean function F is implemented in, in you know, in um, implemented uh, in this block here. And the data points also must be implemented in this block. Bear with me, that's a leap of faith that that's doable at all, but bear with me. If we can implement our function F and encode our data in this uh, 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 quantum transformation F, what can we do? Uh, we, can be, we can rest assured that because F that we're looking at is classically polynomial time solvable, there has to be, the math says there has to be a quantum implementation that also uses only a polynomial number of gates, okay? So therefore it also, it will have, not that it, it should have, it will have an efficient quantum implementation. It's a, a, a spoiler, we just don't know what it looks like, but there is one. So if there is one, if we know how to implement F, what can we do? 
we initialize the 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 uh, a circuit a VV circuit with n plus one qubits, the top n qubits, which encodes the selection you know that that we're interested in with uh, the 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 zero state, and then the the n, the n plus one qubit with the one state, and then you know phi one the the composed quantum state uh, with the tensor product that uh, Michael introduced earlier is that. And then you pass it through, you put it through uniform superposition, which means that you also put it, you put it through a, a composed com, composition of n plus one Hadamard gates. So now, now the phi two is nothing but a uniformly superposition, uniformly superposed quantum state. Now you pass it through the quant, uh, the function f. Okay. So I'm not going to go through the detail because it's actually not that important. Everything that I've said here are very very standard quantum operations. Honestly, if you ask me now, how do you get here from here? I have forgotten because it's so standard that I didn't bother to memorize it. So what we want to get at is after we pass it through function f, we pass it through the n plus one composed Hadamard gates again. And you can show that in the top n qubits, uh, you have exactly the influence values that you're looking for. In one quantum step in one quantum transformation, you check through all the combinations two to the N and you get all the N influences that you're looking for. So that sounds good, right? But it isn't because there's always a catch. Yes, the state that you pops out of the quantum circuit contains the, the values you're looking for, but you need to measure them before you get anything sensible. So once you measure them, the phi for state collapses and that, 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 that information is lost, okay? You can get empirical samples of it and, and that's what you have to do. Uh, that's what the only thing nature allows you to do. So then what do we do? We run the circuit again, okay? Again, we're having to do sampling run the circuit m times. Uh, every time the circuit is run, we sample the alphas. And by sampling meaning, we're just saying for the ith point, is an outlier on inlier. Sample from, from the, uh, you measure the, the qubit corresponding to that point, see if you get one or zero. If it's one, it's an outlier. If it's zero, it's an inlier. Then over m times, calculate the statistics of that. And then you can use the same analysis with the Hofding inequality to show that, okay, you can also place the same probabilistic bounds on it. So the speed up we get is, remember that in the classical case, we need to evaluate F N times M times, N times M times. In the quantum approximation case, uh, we only run this for M times. The inner N loop is, 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 is no need. Okay, you can just directly sample. And we showed that this uh, approximation algorithm uh, does work as well. Uh, uh, this only is uh, simulated uh, because the, the trick of putting the F function in the block is work in progress. So as I said, the catch is how do you implement F? We know one must exist, all right? Because it's a, a polynomial time in classical. Work in progress, we're working on this. Um, and uh, yeah, we're hopeful that something can be done. I'd also like to advertise another line of work towards uh, this uh, robust fitting problem that uses quantum annealing uh, and uh, basically transforming to a, the, the, the problem to a, to a hypergraph vertex cover problem, which has a convenient uh, cubo implementation. And therefore, we can chuck it into the uh, quantum annealer directly. So I'm not gonna go through details of this. Uh, comparisons between CPU and QPU, uh, yeah, details uh, are in, in the paper or come and talk to me. And here are some uh, references for our line of work here. I'd like to end this uh, talk by quoting Peter Shaw. Shaw is of course the originator of the uh, uh, factorization algorithm, the one with the exponential speed up, all right? So he wrote a survey 
paper or communication paper, why haven't more quantum algorithms be found? And he listed a few reasons. Uh, partly it's because uh, you know, the quantum approach is so different that algorithm designers are finding it hard to dream up or come up with new algorithms. There are other, other reasons that he, he uh, hypothesized in the paper. But in the last paragraph, he says, one research area that might be worth exploring is to try to find faster quantum algorithms for problems that already known to be classically solvable in polynomial time. So I think it was Michael who mentioned the, the big factor at the front. So this is Peter Shaw saying, maybe we should look at that factor instead of trying to justify quantum always by trying to find that super polynomial speed up. And I think that's the approach that we need to take in computer vision as well with GPU uh, being so, GPU solutions being so successful, you know, uh, it, you know it, it, it's, it's, uh, it, it's hard to beat and uh, we need to be more, I guess, uh, realistic with what we can achieve and what we can convince the community with. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you a lot for that really engaging uh, talk. Um, and we have time for a few questions. And I would actually start with one. Um, when you measure the relevance of each of the points, um, do you need to measure them separately due to entanglement or can you measure all of the points uh, at once? Uh, I think you measure them separately. I could be wrong on that. Okay. I think you measure them separately. Thank you. Yes. First of all, thanks a lot for the very interesting and nice talk. Thank you. Uh, I'm wondering, do you have a proof that the point of, say, least influence is actually an inlier in the best solution for your original problem? The original problem, no. Mm -hmm. So the problem that we end up solving, that we end up converting to so that we can push in the quantum solution is already different from the original problem. Okay. Do you know a counterexample or adversarial case? We, I have no counterexample yet, but my colleagues have done an anal analysis on the ideal single structure case where you know the distribution of inliers, you know the distribution of outliers, and it's provable that the influence is a measure of outliers. So one positive case, I think, there are probably an infinite number of uh, adversarial cases. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. Any other questions? Uh, maybe I can ask one. Yep. So regarding the uh, paper on robust fitting with quantum annealing, uh, so I think you've compared the CPU against the QPU. I would wonder on the high level, how do the gate-based version of robust fitting and the adiabatic version, uh, so AQC version of robust fitting compare on a high level? On a high level that we haven't done the comparison because we we haven't figured out exactly how to put F in the in the gate model yet. I see. Mm -hmm. So that's work in progress. Mm -hmm. Once we get the results, we will we will email you. Current mm -hmm. results tells me that um, uh, the gate model will also suffer from noise mm -hmm. because of decoherence or mm -hmm. whatever. And uh, yeah. Um, which is not different from the quantum annealing. Okay, thank you. If there are no further questions, let's thank the speaker once more. Thank you very much. And last but not least. Mathematics from Arizona State University in 2012 through the SMART Scholarship Program. 
and more recently completed a master's degree in computer science with specialization in machine learning in at Georgia Tech. Her doctoral research bridged both mathematics and computer science with a focus on De Bruyne sequences and gray codes for combinatorial objects. Yeah, and all right. We are looking forward. Thank you. Can you hear me on Zoom? Yep, totally. Okay, perfect. All right. All right. So thank you for inviting me to come speak here. Um, my talk's going to be a little bit different. I'm not a computer vision. Huh? It's. Uh, oh, on, so are you all? You yeah. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. Sorry. <laughs> I thought you had shared it. It's coming. Good. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. So my background is not in computer vision. So um, I do not have a ton of experience in that area. Um, as was mentioned, so my background is in discrete math and computer science. So I've been at D Wave for a little over five years. I do a lot of our technical training, tutorials, workshops, um, kind of tracking different applications and use cases on our platform. So today I thought I'd primarily just kind of give an overview of what D-Wave has available, kind of where we've come from, and a little bit about what our system looks like. Uh, happy to take any questions um, throughout or at the end as we go through. Hopefully this isn't a little, it's not too marketing or fluffy for you all, but we'll see how it goes. Um, so as we've heard, um, there's kind of two different models of quantum computing out there, and they are very, very different, both in applications and how you use them. So D-Wave right now offers quantum annealing. We are also building a gate model system that will be available in the future. So we really view it as, you know, there's space for both of these models. Um, they are very different to use. As you can see here from some of the applications that are listed, they have their own strengths and weaknesses on both sides. So annealing is really what I'm here to talk about today. It's definitely um, the most scaled up that you'll see available. I view it as the easiest to use um, and get started. It's got a lot of really relevant applications, both in computer vision and in industry. So we work with a lot of different groups on a ton of different things. So these are just some of the examples of different problems that we've seen people working in. So things like scheduling, routing, all of those sorts of like combinatorial optimization problems tend to be really, really good fits for quantum annealing. So this is the very hand wavy explanation for those of you that are here and are kind of brand new to quantum annealing. Um, really what we like to think about this is as if you have a landscape, which you can think of as like a cost function, something that you're trying to minimize. So you've got an objective, which is your cost that you're trying to minimize and you've got constraints which kind of determine which of those solutions are feasible or not. And really what we want to do is we want to explore that whole landscape to find the lowest value, the minimum. That's what quantum annealing is really doing. And whereas your classical algorithms are kind of going to be sequential looking throughout that space, uh, quantum annealing is going to use quantum effects like tunneling, superposition, entanglement, to really search through that space very efficiently, very quickly, and kind of simultaneously. That is a very hand wavy, non-technical description of what it is, but it's a nice mental picture to kind of imagine like what quantum annealing is doing. It's using those natural effects to minimize. So at a glance, um, D-Wave has been around for quite a while. We are local to here in Vancouver. Um, so we were founded in 1999. We've really been working in this space for a long time. Our office is about 20 minutes from here. That's where our labs are. Uh, we have a huge R&D component in our company, and we work with a lot of commercial customers as well as academics around the world. We have a lot of different use cases, a lot of different offerings, which I'll talk about in a minute. 
So there was a question earlier about like, how do you access these? Not everyone has a quantum computer like in their office. And so this is a little bit of what we do have available. Um, so Advantage is our largest, most performant quantum computer that's available right now. Uh, it has over 5,000 qubits. Uh, this is our fifth generation quantum computer. We've had everything from, you know, one to two qubits scaled up through time since 1999 to where we are today. This is all offered through a cloud platform called Leap. So Leap is completely in your web browser. Anyone in, you know, our Leap countries can go and sign up for free. So if you wanted to try it out, you want to see what the environment looks like, what the software tools look like. Anyone can access that there. And, you know, it's available with real-time access almost every day. You know, we have small maintenance windows throughout the year, but the majority of the time it's up and online and ready to be used. We have a bunch of different quantum computers, actually. We don't just have one. Um, so we have our Advantage system that's online for everyone to use that's in our lab, like I mentioned, 20 minutes from here. We also have one in Southern California and we have one in Germany at the ULIC Supercomputing Center. We also have online a prototype of our next generation system, which I'll talk about a little bit more, as well as a whole suite of hybrid solvers that are available for larger, more real world size problems. So as you can imagine with 5,000 qubits, for some problems, 5,000 is a large number of variables, but for many in the real world, that's a really small number of variables that you can use up very quickly. So these hybrid solvers allow you to run problems with up to a million variables. So when you're thinking about, you know, real world problems in these formulations with binary variables, these really allow you to scale up and like really see what you can do with these hybrid algorithms. The next circle is Ocean. So Ocean is our Python tool suite. So um, almost everything in there is open source. So if you wanted to go in and look at exactly how some of these tools are implemented, some of the algorithms for things like a minimum vertex cover that we have in our tool set, you can go and look at exactly how these are implemented using Python. Uh, it's pretty basic and easy to use. We also have, with some of our hybrid solvers, tried to abstract away a lot of the parameter tuning that goes alongside using the quantum computers. So you can kind of choose, do you want to run directly on the quantum computer and really have control over all of those parameters? Or you can try out using our hybrid algorithms where you can really just give it like, this is the function I want to minimize. Here is my set of constraints. And it will do all of the formulation and everything and all the parameter tuning for you. So really all the way across the spectrum of how much control you want to have over that. We've kind of built all of that into our ocean tool suite. Yeah. Yeah, so I'm just going to repeat for the people on Zoom. So there was a question about how like Q Sharp and other packages work in relation to ours and whether you can use one on other systems. Yeah. Um, yeah, so right now, unfortunately, what you're seeing is that pretty much each quantum hardware provider is developing their own toolkit for their own systems. Um, so like Q Sharp is only going to work with the Microsoft products and Qiskit is pretty much only going to work with the IBM products. Um, we did a, uh, I don't know if it's still there or not, we did a plugin to work with Qiskit so that you could use our solver as the backend on some of your Qiskit algorithms. But aside from kind of those little custom plugins and tools, they're going to pretty much be standalone, yeah. Yeah, so again, this, so the question was, is there um, like a central project to kind of combine all of these? Um, there's a lot of quantum um, like services or like platform providers that are kind of trying to consolidate a lot of this. Um, so you'll see groups like um, like Strangeworks can offer access to multiple platforms. I think like um, AWS Bracket has access to many different platforms. Um, one of the things though that's very different is like the gate model algorithms and the annealing algorithms are just structured very differently. Um, so I think even when you know you have these platforms that offer different hardwares or things that are um, like hardware agnostic, I think a lot of times it would really benefit to, it would benefit you as the user to understand the hardware that you're using to really maximize the benefits of using it. 
Yeah. It's a good question though. Um, cool. Yeah. So ocean, like I mentioned, it's in Python. You can use it with a quick, easy pip install in your computer. Um, but we also have an in-browser development environment. So you can go and spin up a virtual environment right in your web browser, run all of your code there. It's very similar to Visual Studio. If you've used that, it has a nice visualizer so that you can kind of see how your problem's embedded on the quantum computer. So there's a lot of really cool things there to help you get started um, through our lead platform and with Ocean. Launches uh, professional services, that's really like mostly commercial customers are interested in that. So um, yeah, we, we have a team that's really working to examine those commercial problems, look at all of the, uh, the ins and outs and analyze those and build up um, custom solutions for those customers. All right, so I mentioned that DWA has been around for like 20 years. And so we have produced quite a bit of results along the way. Um, so as I mentioned, you know, we're kind of building up that hardware with um, each generation. So our last generation platform was the 2000Q. Um, and now we're on the Advantage platform and working on the Advantage 2 platform. Like I mentioned, you'll see on the far right, we're also working on a gate model system. And then in that teal bar along the bottom, we have these hybrid solvers and everything that goes with our cloud platform. Along the way, we're also working on, you know, um, good academic research in our R&D side, looking at, you know, what are the quantum effects using the annealer? How are they working? What kind of speed up can we get? What are we seeing? And we're very focused on like, what can you do now rather than the theoretical bounds of what might be possible in the future? So we have lots lots of different publications that we can share with you, both from our teams as well as external teams that look at, you know, whether they're um, like material science problems, lower level physics experiments, as well as real world problems, looking at commercial advantage for customers where we're looking at improving how they are doing their, their processes in their business today and seeing what we can do better. So some of these that are listed here um, in this orange box in the middle, you see Menton had a hundred times speed up. Menton is a um, like a protein design startup that's looking at protein folding and kind of designing new proteins. Um, this was a group that is kind of a, a small startup that I think came out of the Creative Destruction Lab in uh, Toronto. We also work with like larger grocery chains like Save On Foods, and we look at, you know, their internal processes, lots of optimization problems in retail, and looking at what we can do there. Uh, yeah, I'm going to skip ahead. All right, so let's talk a little bit about the hardware, even though I'm not a hardware specialist, um, I find that this is really useful in understanding our model and how you need to formulate your problems. So I'm going to start with our 2000Q system because it has it's a little bit simpler, so it's easier to see in pictures what's going on. Um, so this is our 2000Q system. So on the right, you see like this golden chandelier that you see with a lot of quantum computing companies uh, that use superconducting qubits. So this is going inside of a massive black box that is going to cool this down to around 20 millikelvin. So for superconducting qubits, we need to get it as close to absolute zero as possible. We want to shield it from noise and all of that kind of stuff. And so that's really what all of this technology in that top right corner picture is doing. And then way down at the bottom, zoomed in in the larger picture, that's our uh, sample holder where you can actually see the chip right there in the bottom. Now, if you look closely, and I'm not sure if the resolution is good enough, but you should be able to see a little bit of like a grid pattern. Um, and so if you counted, it would be like 16 by 16 tiny squares on that chip there. Each one of these squares is what we call a unit cell, and this is where the qubits actually live. So in this unit cell, you can see lines going across horizontally as well as vertically. And each one of these is a qubit. It's a tiny loop of metal where the current can flow um, and it can flow in one direction, the other, or both at the same time. So each one of these is a qubit. And so you see four going across and four going down. So that's eight qubits in one unit cell, 16 by 16 uh, unit cells. And so that gives you the 2048 qubits on the D-Wave 2000Q system. 
So this is what it would look like if you really, really zoomed in, but you don't normally see it drawn like this. You actually see most of the qubit, QPU chips drawn in this way, where each of the qubits is a circle and a line connecting them means that they are coupled together. On the physical chip, being coupled together means that they cross. So if they cross, then we can put a Josephson junction there. We can basically say, um, we can have relationships between these two qubits that say things like take the same value or take different values. So here in this drawing, in this zoomed in square, that's like a different way to draw one of these unit cells with four qubits um, going across and four going up and down. So each one of these lines means that those qubits crossed, they can influence each other, they are coupled together. And so you can see this big picture on the right is the full 2000Q chip. Um, one thing that you'll notice is that there are kind of gaps in it. So for example, if I, can you see my mouse there? Yeah. Um, if you look down at the bottom here, I don't know if you can see this, but like, like around here, uh, there are some gaps. And essentially what that means is that when we calibrated the chip, um, we check each and every qubit on the chip and make sure that it's controllable to our approved level of precision. And if it's not, then we just kind of like disable it so you can't use it. But next time we calibrate it, it might be fine. So this is how you can tell that this is a picture real chip that was online and was calibrated is there's some of those missing. This is why we call it the 2000 Q and we say over 2000 qubits when in fact, if you counted them, it would be 2048. So this is usually how you see them drawn with these circles and the lines between them. And this is important because this is the way you're going to formulate a problem to run it on the quantum annealer. So essentially what I have here are linear terms in the first summation, those Qs, those are your binary variables. And the As there, you get to choose those as a coefficient. That's your choice as part of your formulation. You can think about these linear terms like those individual qubits. Then in the second summation, we have quadratic terms. Those are like the qubits that are coupled together. And so essentially when you need to formulate a problem to run it on the quantum annealer, you will have to put it into this kind of quadratic form. This is that quadratic unconstrained binary optimization, QBO that you've heard mentioned earlier today. So this seems like a really, really simple form and it seems like it might not be that interesting, but it is actually quite interesting. Um, there's a lot of really, really hard problems that can be mapped to this form. So um, there was a great paper done by someone named Andrew Lucas that looked at CARP's original 21 NP complete problems and mapped all of them to this form. So that means that you could take any of those original NP complete problems, map them to this form and run it on the quantum computer. So right there, right off the bat, a lot of really interesting problems. So essentially you have these linear and quadratic terms because what the chip is made up of is those individual qubits and qubits coupled together. So I mentioned those pictures earlier, that was the 2000 Q system. That system has since been deprecated because our advantage system has over 5,000 qubits. So this is a nice animation that starts with the chimera topology, that last one I showed you. And there you see that unit cell. And now it's gonna add a whole bunch of extra things in there. So extra connections, extra couplers between qubits. And that's what the chip structure of our advantage system looks like. So it gets very complex, very hard to see. Um, and the reason for that is because we want those extra couplers. So I think we've heard it mentioned a few times that like one of the limitations when you're running problems on the quantum computer is that you don't have every qubit connected to every other qubit. So the more connections we can make, the easier it is to embed your problems, the better solutions you're going to get. And so that's a big focus of our hardware team is how do we add more and more of those couplers? Yeah. Yeah. The chip is tiny. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's really like the the physical like hardware of the chip and how you do it. Yeah. It can, which is again, is what makes it complicated to do that. Yeah. I think there was a question in the back too. No, okay. 
Okay, so, okay, so yeah, as I mentioned, you know, our advantage system, this is our most performance system that we have online. So it was released a couple years ago. And then one or two years ago, we did like a performance update, which improved the fab stack and everything on there that reduced the noise and all of that. So the advantage system is over 5,000 qubits. It is also the back end, the quantum piece of our hybrid solvers that we have online as well. So this is running every problem that you run on our solvers. It's going to run on one of these advantage systems, the one in the US, the one in Europe, the one 20 minutes down the road. So I mentioned that we also have a prototype of our next generation system. So our Advantage 2 system, our, our hardware teams are projecting that it's going to be released next year sometime. Um, but in the development of that, we generate lots of smaller chips to check all of the topology and the new structures. Um, and so part of that is that we actually had one that came out really, really good. So we decided to make it available to everyone. So this is a small version. It's only about 500 qubits. But what's exciting about this is it has a new topology again. So we saw the pictures of the Chimera, that 2000Q chip. That one had every qubit connected to, I think it was like eight others. Um, the Chimera chip or the Pegasus chip, which is the Advantage one, that has every qubit connected to 15 others. And now this new one, our Advantage 2 chip is going to have a new structure that's going to have every qubit connected to 20 others. So each step along the way, we're kind of adding those connections in, um, as well as improving, you know, coherence, noise, and all of those other important things along the way. So we have a nice white paper if you're interested in like the specifications and all of that. Um, but this is available online. So anyone that signs up and uses our Leap Cloud platform has access to this prototype chip as well. All right, so I mentioned we also have hybrid solvers. Um, we have a whole class of three different hybrid solvers. These are like portfolio solvers where there's a number of different algorithms running behind the scenes. Uh, the three different forms differ primarily in how you want to formulate your problem. So the first one that we released was our binary uh, quadratic model solver. This is gonna run Cubos like exactly what you ran on the quantum computer but much, much larger, up to a million variables. Uh, we then came out with our discrete quadratic model solver. This allowed you to have not just binary variables, but discrete variables. So each variable can choose its value from a set of up to 10,000 choices rather than just two, zero, one for binary. So this was kind of our first step into generalizing that formulation and making it easier for people to use that their problem might not necessarily fit into that binary format. Then the most recent one is our constrained quadratic model solver. This, is the, this solver is, is really, really easy. If you're just getting started, this is definitely like the easiest one to start with. Um, this one basically like you have your cost function, you have your objective that you're trying to minimize. You have your set of constraints like x1 plus x2 equals five, um, and you feed those all in separately and independently, and it does all of the formulation and parameter tuning for you. We have symbolic uh, variables, so you can literally just like type in the math equation that you wrote down on your piece of paper. So it's very, very easy to use. It's also the most general because you can use binary variables, integer variables, and continuous variables. So this is something that we were asked for a lot was continuous variables. And so we do kind of log those feature requests and, and put those into account and make it happen when we can. So this one, like I mentioned, it's the easiest to use. It's probably the most performant. I would say our commercial customers are primarily focusing on that constrained quadratic model hybrid solver. So these hybrid solvers, I know um, for people that are new to this space, it's not really clear what that means, but basically the hybrid solvers take this really, really large problem that is way larger than the size of the chip, and it uh, smartly figures out how to take that and formulate smaller subproblems that can run on the quantum computer. So this is going to run on both classical and quantum resources all on our platform. So there's a lot of interesting things going on there. 
So like I mentioned, the continuous variables, this was a really exciting addition. We were asked for this all the time when we were meeting with people. Um, before having the ability to use continuous variables, it was really, really painful to kind of like discretize everything and, and fit it into binary variables. You could lose a lot of precision and all of that. And so this really allows you to kind of stick with a more native formulation of your problem. All right, and then the last uh, most recent addition that we have, uh, this is we've seen a lot of interest in feature selection on our uh, using our hybrid solvers. So we have a lot of people looking at different applications of feature selection, whether it's um, like fraud detection and financial networks, um, anomaly detection in like computer networks. Um, feature selection, it's a nice combinatorial problem. So, you know, you have your data, you've got a whole bunch of features and you're trying to choose which of those features are most important. And so you're trying to find the right combination. And so what we have done is we built a plugin for scikit-learn. So essentially the same as you would use any of the scikit-learn existing feature selection tools, you can now just plug in our plugin and it will do the formulation and everything for you and run it on our platforms. So it's a really cool way to kind of just plug it right in and try it out. And not only that, it's open source. So you can go and look at the full formulation and how we're actually constructing that problem to run on our CQM, the constrained quadratic model solver. So there was a webinar on this recently. If you're interested, you can check out on our YouTube channel. There was a full like hour long webinar showing how to use it and some examples there. All right, I think I only have a couple minutes left. Um, so, all right, uh, I mentioned a lot, we have our software toolkit. So the software toolkit Ocean has a ton in it. So this is just a really quick high level of everything that's in there. So. Starting at the bottom, basically you've got different compute resources available. You've got CPUs, GPUs, and QPUs. So this could be everything from like this laptop that I'm gonna run my Python program on to the quantum computers and the hybrid solvers on our cloud platform. Within our software toolkit, we, we have what we call samplers or solvers. And these are the actual tools that you're going to use to solve your problem and are going to run on those compute resources. So for example, the D-Wave API that's using the quantum computer directly, the hybrid solvers I've mentioned. We also have some classical solvers in there like simulated annealing, taboo search, um, different classical solvers. So you can kind of um, debug and test your code on those first. And so, yeah, we add new solvers. Like I mentioned with those hybrid solvers, they kind of rolled out over time. So you can definitely see additions pop up in this row. Above that, we have our problem formulation. This is really that cubo or binary quadratic model, or if you're using one of those hybrid solvers, you've got the more general forms. And so our Ocean Toolkit allows you to formulate these in a number of different ways. There's lots of different things you can do with those. Above that, we also have some specific packages that are really useful for getting started. So for example, we have a graph mapping package called D-Wave Network X. It's built on top of the Network X package that's really handy if you're doing any graph theory problems. It has built into it a couple um, like formulation functions already for things like maximum independent set, traveling salesman, lots of different things in that area. And again, open source, so you can go and see how those formulations are done. All right, I think I'm just gonna leave it at this. Um, I know this is primarily for computer vision, but there are tons of applications in different areas. So this is just a small snapshot of everything that we have and we've seen from different users and customers in a lot of different industries. So tons more information on our website. If you're interested in applications in specific areas, just let me know. Uh, but yeah, I would really encourage you to just go and try it and play with it. Our Leap Cloud platform, like I mentioned, you can sign up for free. It's got demos, code examples, documentation, everything you could need to get started plus more. So yeah, happy to take any questions. It's time for questions. Yes, Dajun, please. Solution that is delivered, to what extent is the quantum side involved? To what extent is the classical side involved? 
for maintaining user control. I want only the liquid units to solve it and so on the part. Is it possible to do that? So with those hybrid solvers that I listed, no. So those are like our proprietary, like industrial solvers, but we do also have an open source package called D-Wave Hybrid that's designed if you want to build your own hybrid algorithms. So it has kind of like a framework where you can insert different blocks for like decomposition. What solver do you want to use to run your sub problems? How do you want to recombine that and build up um, like a multi-threaded like kind of framework? So that's definitely something that you could do with that package. Yeah. We've got another question over there. Thank you for the interesting talk. Can you say something about the energy consumption of the D-Wave computers? Yeah, I don't know the numbers off the top of my head, but it's super energy efficient compared to like supercomputers for sure. Um, essentially, all of the energy just goes down into like cooling the big black box and there's very little energy required to run it. Um, I want to say it was the number is like 25 kilowatts, but I don't know over like what time period, but very to, energy efficient. For 2000 Q, it was 15 kilowatts hours, like one, once I read it. Just... Oh, okay. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Another question. Hi. Uh, so if you run your, uh, your software on, let's say, a 500 uh, qubit system, how well does it scale? Is there any way you can find, like, all the work that you do to optimize or get your problem working on a smaller scale, does it just automatically scale to the larger qubit systems? Like the 512 going up to whatever the new advanced qubit is. Yeah, no, that's a really good question. Um, so it can be a little bit trickier than that. Um, so when you're scaling up problems, so I think in the first talk, there was a mention of like, when you have to use a few qubits to represent one variable, um, and as you scale up, those like chains of qubits get longer and that can um, affect the quality of your solutions. So you may need to do more parameter tuning. You may need to adjust like the anneal time and anneal schedules. Usually as you scale up, there's, it's, it's harder and harder to control it as you use more and more of the chip basically. So, yeah. We have one question online. I think this this is me, right? Yes, please. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, Victoria, for the nice talk and uh, you know giving us a very nice overview of uh, the wave. I have one question. So, um, most of the API that is open to us allows us to submit problems, and I would say usually from a very high level. Um, and of course, it kind of allows us to control parameters or sample solutions. Um, but for example, can we go go deeper than that? Can we actually uh, specify how the Hamiltonians are initialized um, on the wave? Uh, because we would like to somehow maybe implement some interesting algorithms that uh, that are, you know, that have some kind of uh, physics basis. So to do that, we need to touch the Hamiltonians from time to time. At least initialization of that. Can we do that? So right now that sort of thing isn't exposed to external users. So like there are ways to do that that our internal research teams have done, but yeah, I get asked for that a lot and it's not something that we have available right now. Okay. And if we have a custom project, uh, would DWave be able to support, let's say, just give some internal um, access or, or, uh, or just run these models internally for us kind of? Uh, we'd have to talk. I don't know. <laughs> I'd okay. have to check with the hardware teams. Like I know they do that because our lab, we have like a bunch of quantum computers and only one is available to external users. Cause it, yeah, it just, it requires a lower level of access than most people have. Um, but yeah, we could talk about that and see. Great. Thanks. It's not up to me. <laughs> All right. Well, let's thank Victoria once again. Thanks a lot. Thank you. So now we will proceed with this short panel discussion before.
You still hear us, Tolga? Yes, okay, now I hear. Perfect. And everything works. All right, so I think you can hear me also online. Um, we've covered a lot of topics today, starting from quantum-inspired methods, then we covered gate-based approaches, including uh, quantum machine learning, and a lot of methods using a diabetic, uh model, right? Maybe one question, we would like to know your perspective. How to start a QCV? project how to find exciting new problems uh, to work on like what what would you suggest uh, to people who would like maybe to uh, start working in this area arbitrary order yes this way. <laughs> okay uh, maybe my my way into this was hiring someone from physics uh, <laughs> but um I don't know if I have a good answer. So since I'm primarily working on uh, quantum annealing, that is seeing which problems could be phrased as cubos, which people have maybe not dared because we know they are NP hard to solve. Uh, and then taking this perspective that I try to highlight at the end of my talk, what happens if cubos are easy to solve now or in the future? Um, maybe this leads to new ways of phrasing problems. I think the, the way Michael uh, suggested is, is good. Uh, uh, the, the cubo fashion, you know, uh, you know, is an optimization problem. And uh, lots of uh, uh, computer vision being a computer, computer science field, uh, and many people in this area should be, you know, very familiar with uh, combinatorial optimization. So that's a good starting point. Um, uh, the only thing I would add on top of that is I think uh, setting the right expectations is important. Um, uh, you know, computer vision is already very, very successful, you know, using other compute paradigms. Uh, we, we can't hope to beat, you know, those established methods overnight. So setting the right expectations uh, is, is important. Getting just something to work and work well, uh, you know, is already a very, very good achievement. Know that I really have much to add. I mean, I think um, looking at the existing work and what's already been done, you know, in all of these groups is a really good place to start. I also like some general advice that I will generally give people moving into quantum computing or considering what are good use cases is if you already have something that works really, really well, really, really efficiently, you probably don't need quantum computing. Look for the problems that, you know, have been too hard to consider or you're just the current methods are, are just not cutting it. They're not good enough for what you need to do. Maybe the solutions aren't good enough. Maybe you're not getting answers fast enough. Those sorts of areas um, really look at where you need those improvements and, and start with those hard problems. Thank you. Uh, Anand, would you like to comment? Um, yeah, sure. The um, uh, Just to be a little bit on the contrarian side here, um, one area of computer vision that tends to get much less love is um, areas like shape from shading and areas that involve actual modeling of light and its interaction in a, in a system with machine learning. So if you're looking for to, to do something outside the box with potentially less um, competition, you might want to go more into, into actual modeling of Hamiltonians in shape from shading and then map that onto a QC, that could be interesting because that's not something that many people would be able to do. But if you have a physics background, you'd be capable of doing that. Nice, thank you. So one thought that actually um, was, was just mentioned is that to publish a quantum computer vision paper, it's not important at the moment to outperform classical approaches. It's important to, to see how the new, a new method compares to the previous quantum state of the art. And if there is an additional advantage uh, that the method also performs 
well with respect to classical state of the art that's that's great so it's it's at this stage it's important to investigate what which problems can benefit from the quantum computational paradigms right so and generally re next question will be regarding future so predicting predicting future is very difficult and a lot of scenarios are superimposed at the moment and when they will be measured uh, there can be multiple outcomes in future. So what are those superimposed states which can be measured, let's say, in midterm in five, seven, ten years from your perspective? How the field will evolve over the time? Ha both on the hardware and software and uh, QCV side and hardware side. Uh, okay. <laughs> I think, I mean, so like I mentioned in my talk, I think there we're going to see kind of parallel tracks of the annealing and gate model both continuing, you know, especially as gate model uh, is able to ramp up and figure out a lot of the issues with noise and error mitigation and all of that sort of thing that you're seeing a lot in the media. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I think that there's going to be space for both of those and we're going to see advancements on the hardware side and the software side um, in both areas. Um, I'd like to, I mean, what, what Victoria mentioned is, is, is great. I think uh, there, there is hope for, for this to work. Uh, I'd like to offer another perspective, and I already showed that in my presentation today. Look at, quant think of quantum computing as a different angle to look at computation. It might yield results in classical computing that you, you never expected. And there has been more, you know, there's been several influential uh, results that were inspired by, you know, perspectives from quantum computing, but those results were, were you know, uh, uh, amazing in, in the classical sense. Uh, I mean, Anand's talk kind of uh, uh, approached that from that angle as well. So think of quantum computing as, you know, a, a curiosity more than something that will speed up your problem immediately. Yeah, absolutely. I can only agree. So there is value in developing these methods, even if the hardware will not be able to support it immediately. Um, so I hope for this field to grow also in the computer vision community. And then on the long run, of course, it would be great if the hardware catches up to all these amazing algorithms, even in the gate based setting that have been developed. Mm -hmm. All right, um, Anand. Uh, nothing much to really add, except that um, something might come out of left field, right? I mean, that we tend to think, uh, we tend to do linear prediction, and we, we you know, are blindsided by something that comes out of nowhere. So what could come out of nowhere is something on the sensor side, for example, which forces mm -hmm. everybody to, to go more into a quantum computing direction that could happen, which is an unusual thing to happen, right? Why would sensors and QC be connected? But they could. So that's a possibility. Okay, all right. And the third question um, is actually already partially answered. So it would have been like even, for instance, currently, we do not have uh, gate based quantum computers which can solve problems in, in different domains of science, which are relevant uh, from the practical perspective, perspective. Think about, for instance, uh, about the Shor's algorithm. The largest number, which has been factorized to date, is 21 on, on real gate-based quantum hardware. And the question would have been, nevertheless, even if we do not have, we will not have such quantum hardware in the midterm, what would be incentive to work nevertheless? what could motivate nevertheless to consider uh, such methods which can be mappable to quantum hardware so i think partially it already has been right answered that um, something can come up which which is also relevant for uh, for the classical computer vision i think i think because our field computer vision is so successful that sometimes many of us forget that we're actually scientists and you know, first and foremost, we should be driven by curiosity, in my opinion, and uh, not you know benchmark numbers. So uh, that's just my small right. addition. Right. Okay. By the way, a lot of methods which have been presented today are 
in the area of matching problems, graph matching, uh, point set alignment or shape alignment. Um, also, the works presented at the poster sessions, such as um, quantum motion segmentation, they all seem to have this common element of uh, of finding correspondences, of finding associating the data. Um, so, is it actually what the quantum hardware currently best for, or do you see other application areas? <laughs> I mean, one of them would be also robust fitting, right? Uh, that's also kind of matching. Exactly, <laughs> right. <laughs> so yes, my, my easy answer would be, currently we are looking for combinatorial problems or zero one representations and then indicating belonging to a set, yes or no with zero and one is, is the most natural mm -hmm. starting point for, for many of us, I guess. But it, I wouldn't exclude that it will expand into more areas. I think in, from the poster sessions, there are I, I saw at least one. There's probably more than one papers that is not doing matching for you know computer vision mm -hmm. problems using quantum computing. So th there is definitely a lot of scope. Right. Thank you. Um, Anand, maybe. Um, so so the the. The, the one thing that gives me pause a little bit, so, so for example, right, I, uh, I, was, I wrote my first simulated annealing program in 1984, and uh, it took a month, right, to, 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 to converge on, on what passed for computers then. And my, my worry is that simulated annealing was, you know, pretty hot, and so was diffusion, that, that you know, diffusion as in Langevin diffusion, from let's say 84, 85 until about, 92, 93, and then and then it just stopped because basically what happened is that it it never kind of crossed over into um, beyond that that speed barrier that people faced. So you have to keep the faith because what what might happen is um, quantum annealing. Um, you could go through something similar. You'd have to kind of weather through that period when you're completely out in the wilderness. And, and sort of be prepared for that. Sorry to be kind of like a you know, Debbie Downer on that, but just, just be aware of that, that that could happen. Right. And uh, Anand, do you see uh, the way how the classical quantum inspired methods from 2000s, right? And from uh, 2010 could be revived and uh, so to say, implemented in a new way considering the new developments in the field. For instance, you've mentioned uh, in today's talk Fourier transform, right? For instance, can it be replaced by quantum Fourier transform or is it gonna be, let's say, a method uh, also for matching, right? Shapes, again, matching, operating on quantum data. So a quantum uh, approach operating on quantum data or how do you see that? For instance, also the equations, the Schrodinger uh, equations and evolution of the wave function that you've presented, uh, yeah. Um, so, so there are two ways things could go, right? That there's the mapping onto quantum computing, whether it's going to be um, quantum annealing or if it's going to be gate-based or something else, whatever. There's that aspect, which is heavily, heavily constrained by, by present day, day hardware and also what you might expect from hardware in the next five years. But there's the other side of it, which is also important, which, is, which, is, which has been alluded to by many people, which is that that quantum ways of thinking give you a, a kind of creativity into being able to model things in a different way than your typical deep learning person. Sorry, sorry to be nasty to deep learning people, but you know where I'm coming from. So there's that that creative side which comes from modeling things by being inspired by QM. Mm -hmm. And if these two can can be put on parallel tracks and proceed with cross pollination between the two, good things can happen. All right. Yeah, so essentially uh, the community is not used to quantum mechanical basics foundations at the moment right they're not they're not difficult it's just they you have to so to say um yeah accustomed to them right all right so maybe we also can open the floor for further few questions if you have to our invited speakers please um line up we have a few minutes more. Is uh, Roberto also on the panel? 
Uh, unfortunately, he's not well, currently in the call. Okay. Yeah, he had to leave a bit earlier today. Guys, any other questions? All right, if there are no further questions, yes, please, one question over there. Uh, uh, I think there's, there's, there's more than one question in there. Number one is a scale of the data. Uh, don't quite know how to solve that. But the type of data, uh, I think one, one, uh, a few ways to get around that, you know, you know images are, are two dimensional, three channels. Um, uh, you could convert it to binary images to try out uh, some of these machines that, uh, you know, deal with more binary typically. Uh, the other way is to apply some sort of uh, feature extraction method so that you reduce that image to, you know, discrete numbers that you can, you can work with. Uh, not everything has to be end to end like in deep learning. Yeah, maybe uh, that's even part of the reason why so many have done matching problems. It's not super easy to prepare a quantum state that represents an entire image. This is one image is a lot of data and not easy to embed already. Right, so most algorithms actually operate on more abstract representations than, than pixels, right? Okay, and we have one question from Tolga also online. Yes, so my question is about uh, quantum annealing in, in general. Right now when we use D-Wave, um, we kind of find solutions that we, we think they are good. We, these solutions are either the minimum energy solutions or the most frequent solutions, uh, however you, uh, you compute them or filter them. Uh, but what about all the other samples that a quantum annealer generates? Is there a good and principled way of making use of them? Um, or do you have perspectives in, in those research directions? I mean, so I can speak in general where we've seen having that full set of samples really useful is, um, I'm trying to think of an example in terms of computer vision, but I can't, but in terms of, so imagine someone that's trying to do like a big routing problem and figure out the best way to like make deliveries. If you have multiple solutions and you have like a last minute, like this road is closed, you've got all of these other solutions to choose from. So they might not be as good, but you have them sitting there ready to go. So it's kind of nice to have the alternative options. That's where I've seen it be really useful is in kind of like making your whole solution set a little bit more robust to like last minute changes. But generally there is no guarantee that if the ground uh, state is found the best possible solution that also the annealer would return the second best and the third best. Correct. Right? Yeah. yeah. Right. All right. Okay. So if there are no further questions, let's thank our panelists. A big round of applause. And we have approached concluding remarks. Perfect. Um, yeah, so I think what uh, TJ said, uh, yeah, during the panel discussion uh, was really nice. And I think it's a good uh, closing thought for our workshop um, that we have a topic here that makes a lot of us very curious uh, about how we can continue here. Um, and yeah, even so, we might not be able to beat uh, all of the benchmarks uh, right now. It's a topic we should investigate uh, as scientists. Um, yeah, and I would like to uh, thank of all of our speakers today who were here in person as well as uh, online uh, for yeah being at the forefront uh, of that topic uh, and uh, contributing here to our workshop.
Um, yeah, and the same uh, holds for all of our poster presenters who were here uh, today in person, uh, as well as to everyone who was uh, not able to come here but submitted a slide. Um, and that's where I would like to uh, point to uh, our website. Um, so we currently plan to have all of the talks online, um, as well as we have a selection of uh, papers there, uh, all prepared with a short summary slide that's a bit shorter than a poster. Um, those contain all the posters from today, as well as additional uh, works and uh, also some work in progress that has not yet been uh, published. Um, yeah, so let me look at my notes here quickly, not that I forget something important. Um, but I think that uh, everything I hope we sparked uh, your interest uh, in the topic. Um, I think it were quite a lot of uh, diverse presentations to today. Uh, thank you all for uh, being here uh, and uh, thanks for uh, to Tolga for being our uh, main organizer uh, and for uh, starting all of that and yeah maybe you also have a last uh, sentence you want to say here well not much uh, you beautifully summarized and i want to thank everyone again and making this happen this is great this is the first time and uh, let's repeat this i mean i i am i am uh, very optimistic that there will be progress in this field um, and uh, we could build a community around this and, you know, kind of work towards um, interesting, uh, finding interesting solutions uh, to our problems. Um, so thanks for joining. Perfect. Thanks a lot. Thank you. You have your laptop back. <laughs> <laughs>